Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Simon Duffy. I run the Centre for Welfare Reform. Um, I'm really delighted that we're running this session. Um, I'll just say a little bit about the Centre for Welfare Reform, who's hosting the session, and, and introduce Mo. Um, the Centre was set up in 2009. Um, despite the challenges of austerity and uh, the ongoing uh, rule of a right-wing government in Whitehall and Westminster, uh, the Centre has survived. And we have managed to continue to uh, share research, uh, social innovations, um, and work to challenge the attacks on the welfare state and offer a positive vision for improving the welfare state. It's, it has been difficult um, as austerity has eaten away resources for improving the welfare state. Um, it's been very difficult for the centre even just to earn a living for it to survive. And yet we've managed to do so mostly just by doing most of the work for love. Uh, and um, we've been benefited hugely by, uh, now we have 120 fellows who have who've joined the centre, who've shared their work for free and have created a community that has not been intimidated by government policy and by kind of financial manipulation, but are willing to try and keep working at building a better world. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to, to do this. And, um, but if we were to pick a fellow at the top of the list of people who've been determined who, to continue speaking the truth, who've not been intimidated, who've not relied on big handouts from public or private bodies, then Mo Stewart would top that list. Yeah. She, her research has um, just recently won a major award for its integrity and importance. Um, and she has continued to batter the those people who seem to want to uh, not listen to what's going on every day pretty much mo sends another powerful email to some important person telling them hey look these are the facts this is what's really going on um it's it's tough the system does not want to hear um there is a complacency and complicity complicity um, even amongst people that you would expect to support basic principles of social justice. I've got to say, and I don't mean to uh, uh, embarrass John McDonnell in this regard, but we have benefited as a movement by only a handful of leading politicians, but John McDonnell is amongst those number, that small number. People like John have continued to support the disability movement, have continued to understand properly what social justice means. Um, although it's of enormous sadness to me that we continue to fail politically to challenge what's going on, it is at least some comfort at times just that some people are prepared to speak truth in the world of power when it is so difficult to speak truth to the world of power. Um, David says my audio is a bit scrambled, I notice, although I should have a really good signal because I've set it up, so apologies. Um, so I hope that's okay. I'm going to really, the way we're going to do this is Mo is going to speak um, to a script that she's done and she's give, present, given me some simple slides to share. She, Mo is a bit shy of being on screen too much. Um, I am going to just very briefly um, put Mo on, on the screen. Um, but you mostly you'll see some slides and let's say there'll be a break after 20 minutes. So Mo, are you happy to go? Absolutely. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself and share the images you've created, but please just go for it. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for joining us here today, and thanks to Simon for hosting this event. I'm delighted to find such a mixed audience that includes academics, students, politicians, disabled activists, and other interested parties. 
This talk is to highlight the Preventable Harm Project that I conducted for 10 years, which concluded in November 2019 with the publication by the Centre of the Influences and Consequences Report. Since then, I have promoted the research findings, identifying the adoption of a fatally flawed assessment model used to limit access to disability benefits by disregarding clinical opinion. Many claimants of disability benefits were destined to perish when, quite literally, killed by the state, which no one else is talking about. Whilst there has been a lot of academic interest and valuable support, the project was conducted so that the chronically ill and disabled community would better understand why hostile social policies were adopted. To support the talk, I will be using slides and there will be two short breaks during the talk. There are a few things I need to mention before any reference is made to the research findings. There's a lot of evidence from 10 years of work so for anyone who is unfamiliar with my research, please be prepared for evidence which has been described by many as being both harrowing and disturbing, <clears throat> and which may cause distress to anyone who's unfamiliar with the research. The main title of the talk, Killed by the State, is a clue to the evidence I will be sharing. I should also mention that I'm not an academic. I haven't been to university. I don't have a degree, a master's or a PhD, and I certainly don't have a string of letters after my name suggesting I may be capable of conducting this depth of research. I'm a healthcare professional by training, initially trained a lifetime ago in the National Health Service as a cardiac technician supporting open heart surgery before joining the WRF medical branch where I work as a medical technician in neurophysiology until my medical discharge. 10 years is a long time to conduct research on one subject, which is the negative influence of corporate America with UK social policy reform since 1992. The ultimate political ambition is identified as being the removal of the UK welfare state to be replaced by the American system of welfare using private health insurance. Following several years of independent research, my book, Cash Not Care, was published in September 2016. Thanks to a unique working relationship with Policy Press, following the publication of my book, I was able to continue the research as I was provided with confidential access to anything they published. I have no research funding, and I would have been unable to continue the research without this remarkable bond of trust. My first contact with many academics was via their papers published by Policy Press, and I owe an enormous debt of gratitude to Alison Shaw and her team for the very valuable support of my work. Every new report, article or paper I wrote for the project provided additional references confirming the often fatal human consequences of the ongoing demolition of the British welfare state, identified as Thatcher's dark legacy. Meanwhile, neoliberal politicians have spent each passing year since 2010 abusing social policy by challenging the integrity of anyone who claimed long-term sickness and disability benefits. Social policies became increasingly hostile to those in greatest need as preventable harm was created when masquerading as social policy reforms, commonly known as welfare reforms. The coalition government justified the addition of severe austerity measures, which began in 2010, when constantly claiming that the previous Labour government had been irresponsible with welfare funding, which it was claimed was out of control. As Prime Minister, David Cameron was very vocal about the claimed excessive spending on welfare by the last Labour administration, the need to reduce expenditure and to live within our means. This was a very successful misdirection by a neoliberal government, unconcerned with the catastrophic human consequences of what became a brutal reduction of funding for the social policy budget and for social services. In reality, the share of the national income spent on welfare 
was at its peak between 1995 to 96 under the John Major Conservative administration. Certainly costs increased over time, but as a share of the national income, Labour spent less on social policy than the major administration and the punishing austerity programme of the coalition government was spent or was justified by what was a totally false claim. When referring to the long-term sick and disabled community, it has become common practice to make reference to them all as being disabled. Thus, all mention of the chronically ill is removed from debate with a tendency by ministers in the Department for Work and Pensions to trivialise the impact of chronic ill health and permanent disability. In the Cameron Coalition government between 2010 to 2016, those in greatest need were publicly humiliated by a very vocal Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, namely Ian Duncan Smith. He made unfounded claims that there were vast numbers of fraudulent disability benefit claims with his famous references to shirkers and scroungers. This was identified by Dr. Kelly Garthwaite as being a thinly veiled character assassination of disabled people. In fact, the DWP's own figures identified that only 0.5% of disability benefit claims were fraudulent, meaning that 99.5% were genuine claims. It was to be a catastrophic human consequence of this brutal ideology, ideological attack against the chronically ill and disabled community. The past psychological security provided by the welfare state disappeared, as identified in Catherine Hale's groundbreaking 2014 Fulfilling Potential research with input from over 500 service users. And I quote, the worst thing I find is realizing that I'm forced into looking for a life that I want, but have no chance of having. I seriously feel I may kill myself because being sick, having next to no money, no life, no future, no cure, constant pain and constant disapproval and rejection defeats me. Many national charities spoke out against Duncan Smith's hostile rhetoric with inflammatory media coverage linked to a significant increase in disability hate crimes as Duncan Smith's fake news filled the tabloids. Polls by national charities taken in 2012 identified a change in public attitude towards the disabled community, with many disabled people reporting public hostility towards them during the coalition government's term in office. <coughs> Many refused to go outside in fear of the public reaction to them. Again, this level of suffering of the chronically ill and disabled community has been disregarded by most of the national press. Yet many were very happy to demonize the victims of Duncan Smith's hostile rhetoric with their dramatic front page banner headlines. National charities such as Scope, Mencap, Leonard Cheshire Disability, the National Autistic Society, the National Institute for the Blind and the Disability Alliance all protested. They insisted that ministers and civil servants repeatedly highlighting the supposed mass abuse of disability benefit system was totally unfounded. Concerned senior police officers made appeals on regional television news and identified the disturbing increase in dis prosecuted disability hate crimes, including murder, which wasn't even reported by the regional press, let alone the national press. Coincidentally, prosecuted disability hate crimes increased by 213% when Ian Duncan Smith was the Secretary of State of the DWP. Whilst the world is distracted by the COVID pandemic and the UK is distracted by Brexit, there remains this unreported ongoing public health crisis created by the adoption of social policy reforms based on fiscal priorities. These reforms are negatively impacting on the health, the well-being, and often the survival of the chronically ill and disabled community who are unfit to work. They actually now live in fear of the Department for Work and Pensions. There are volumes of published academic research papers 
demonstrating the preventable harm by the DWP of those in greatest need. However, since social policy publishers fail to promote in the public domain the findings of the academic research they publish, few people are aware of this ongoing crisis of human suffering imposed by the DWP. It's surely past time for academic publishers to demonstrate some social responsibility and to promote research findings which have sinister implications for the health and well-being of millions of people. A national press conference to identify significant research findings should not be out of the question for socially responsible academic publishers. When working in healthcare, many of my patients were chronically ill and were living with a life-threatening condition. I never felt the need to terrify them, nor did I feel the need to humiliate them by claiming they were customers of the National Health Service. They were patients and they were treated with care, concern and compassion, which is something that's been missing from UK social policies for the past decade. When chronically ill, disability benefit claimants have enough on their mind without being persecuted by the DWP, who routinely refuse to accept that many claimants are too ill to work and often subject them to brutal financial sanctions when too ill to attend an interview at the job centre. Sanctions remove all income for anyone surviving on benefits. <clears throat> this has led to some chronically ill and disabled claimants actually starving to death in 21st century UK, to this nation's everlasting shame. Yet no one is held to account for this level of extreme and unnecessary human suffering. Possible starvation is now a basis for UK social policies, with no, no one asking how this can possibly be justified. All moral code was abandoned with the adoption of neoliberal politics, known as the politics of greed. These sanctions were welcomed by the adoption of American social and labour market policies by the Blair New Labour government, as identified by Dr Anne de Guerre in her 2004 paper, Importing Workfare, Policy Transfer of Social and Labour Market Policies from the USA to Britain under New Labour. And I quote, according to American writers such as Murray and Mead, Welfare dependency was the main social problem in the USA. Poverty was not the result of a shortage of jobs or social inequality. Instead, deprivation was due to behavioural problems. Jobs were available, but the poor would not take them because they had a low work ethic. Where have we heard that before? Mead's arguments justified the adoption of sanctions and behavioural controls in the US as copied by successive UK neoliberal governments who followed Mead's lead by adopting the rhetoric of blaming the poor, which included the chronically ill and disabled community. Clearly successive neoliberal governments moved UK social policies with each passing year ever closer to resembling an American state. Social policy reforms, which really means social policy destruction, has worked very well. Continuing with Thatcher's dark legacy, Blair's ambition to make access to disability benefit as difficult as possible was achieved by his adoption of American social and labour market policies back in 1997. Thousands have died since 2008 when attempting to claim the Employment and Support Allowance Disability Benefit when deemed fit for work following the dangerous and fatally flawed work capability assessment initially conducted by Atos Healthcare and now conducted by the American corporate giant Maximus. The work capability assessment disregards clinical opinion and some claimants who were refused the ESA benefit died when trying to search for work with a catastrophic illness that's totally disregarded by the DWP. The British Medical Association, the British Psychological Society, the Royal College of Nurses, the Royal College of General Practitioners, 
and the president of the appeal tribunals for social security all insisted that the work capability assessment should be abolished. They were disregarded. The new Marmot Review on Health Equality in England was scaling and recommended the removal of sanctions and the redesign of the new universal credit. This challenges Duncan Smith's latest claims that this new benefit, which amalgamates six benefits into one, including the ESA, is a resounding success. No, it isn't, Duncan Smith. No, it isn't. There's a catalogue of published academic papers demonstrating the additional preventable harm created by the relentless rollout of universal credit. For example, a 2019 British Medical Journal paper by Dr. Mandy Cheatham and colleagues found that, and I quote, the findings add considerable detail to emerging evidence of the deleterious effects of universal credit on vulnerable claimants' health and well-being. Our evidence suggests that universal credit is undermining vulnerable claimants' mental health, increasing the risk of poverty, hardship, destitution, and suicidality. Major evidence-informed revisions are required to improve the design and implementation of universal credit to prevent further adverse effects before large numbers of people move on to universal credit as planned by the UK government. The DWP's solution is to disregard all evidence against the rollout of universal credit. How did we arrive at a situation where those in greatest need now live in fear of the DWP? We arrived at it due to the adoption of neoliberal politics, which has swept the globe. Neoliberal politics is a far right-leaning ideology and is the politics of power, profit and greed with a catastrophic disregard for human need. Neoliberal politics places the market as the top priority with an emphasis to limit corporate taxes and to reduce government spending. The goal of neoliberal politics is to transfer the control of economic factors from the public sector to the private sector, whose profits depend on neoliberal politics being successful. Influenced by the International Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, their policies influence all 37 member countries. The OECD 2003 publication, Transforming Disability into Ability, Policies to Promote Work and Income Security for Disabled People, was instrumental in the welfare reforms of member countries, having identified disability dependency on state financial support by the disabled community. OECD member countries began adopting social policy reforms following the 2003 report, with none so brutal as those gradually adopted in the UK. Margaret Thatcher was the first elected neoliberal politician in the UK. It was during her first term in office as Prime Minister in 1982 that she announced to the Cabinet that she wanted to remove the wealth state, including the National Health Service, to be replaced by the American version of healthcare funded by private insurance. Thatcher's close bond with President Ronald Reagan is well documented and they, they are acknowledged as playing a significant role in encouraging the greater influence of the OECD. Over time, more and more American corporate influence would be identified with UK social policy reforms. This led to an increasingly severe authoritarian state for anyone who was unfit to work and in need of state financial support. It was important to break the past psychological security of the UK, UK welfare state to make it easier to eventually remove. This has now been achieved. That's a lot of evidence to take on board. We'll take a short break now and when we return, I will identify the influence of corporate America since 1992 with the UK's welfare reforms and the DWP's creation of preventable harm to resist funding disability benefits. Back in 10 minutes. Hello again. This is where I must remind you that every government since Thatcher 
has worked towards the removal of the UK welfare state. <coughs> and some of the evidence I'm about to report may cause concern. Preventable harm is identified as being the presence of an identifiable, modifiable cause of harm in healthcare. Here I will demonstrate how preventable harm was created for anyone who's unfit to work, as such as dark legacy is being gradually created by successive UK neoliberal governments. In her 1987 Woman's Own interview, Margaret Thatcher claimed that there was no such thing as society, as demonstrated by her adoption of tolerated harshness. All evidence of a moral code was rejected to decrease expenditure in the public sector and encourage profit for the private sector with tax arrangements in their favour as neoliberal politics impacted on all areas of social policy. Such as devotion to all things American meant that she laid the groundwork for this country's public sector to be abandoned by the state and handed over to unaccountable private corporations at a huge cost to the public purse. The plan to demolish the welfare state clearly enjoys bipartisan support. John Major pursued Thatcher's neoliberal objectives by inviting the services of a notorious American insurance giant to help to create new policies. Blair continued the plan he adopted an active welfare state with financial assistance for unemployment and disability benefits no longer guaranteed. They were dependent upon participation in work-related activities, regardless of inevitable and often fatal human consequences. The Blair administration's New Deal program was actually based on the American workfare approach as emphasised in an OECD 2002 paper advising that benefit receipts should be based on demonstrating an active job search. The Liberal Democrats lost all credibility by abandoning their values to have a seat at the top table in the coalition government, where the addition of brutal and unnecessary austerity measures in 2010 added to the welfare reforms introduced by the brand new Labour administration in 2008 meant that those in greatest need were always destined to suffer. Many would perish. The adoption of the additional austerity measures in 2010 by the coalition government were exposed by Professor Martin McKee as being a political choice, not a financial necessity, and they were adopted without any ethical approval. Professor David White advises that the austerity measures were destined to benefit the rich. As soon as David Cameron started the austerity cuts in 2010, which produced benefit cuts for, of over 20 billion pounds in the first seven years, he actually rewarded the rich by cutting taxes for anyone with an income of 150,000 pounds and over. Due to this austerity strategy, the 1,000 richest people in the UK had actually doubled their wealth by 2017, while some of the poorest in the UK were using food banks to stay alive. Some actually starved to death as the politics of greed took hold and sanctions were broadly distributed against those in greatest need by job centre staff who had far too much authority. The creation of Thatcher's dark legacy began when, having established the growing costs of the welfare budget, John Major searched for corporate help. Known at the time as Union Provident Insurance, <clears throat> Major invited this American company to advise the UK government in 1992. At the time, John Lucasio was the second vice president of Union Provident Insurance. He was appointed in 1994 as the official government advisor for UK welfare claims management. This American corporate insurance giant had successfully created a non-medical biopsychosocial functional model of disability assessment to limit access to health insurance claims. The Cassier would advise the John Major Conservative Administration on how to adopt a similar non-medical BPS assessment in the UK. 
guided by the custody of the 1994 Social Security Incapacity for Work Act introduced incapacity benefit, which replaced invalidity benefit and was designed to limit access to long-term sickness benefit. Professor Mansell Aylward was the principal medical advisor for the then named Department for Social Security and he had a long history of involvement with the private health insurance industry. In 1995, Aylward and Lucasio's academic paper was published and recommended that general practitioners should not be permitted to decide which of their patients were unfit to work. This was the beginning of government imposed preventable harm and justified the adoption of the all work test in 1997 to limit access to incapacity benefit. All clinical opinion was rejected. In 2001, the DSS changed its name to the Department for Work and Pensions. Aylward migrated to the new department and was appointed as the DWP Chief Medical Officer, which was a position he held until April 2005. April has a long-held conviction that the state and the insurance industry should work closely together, which may be why he was appointed. Unum Provident Insurance changed its name to Unum Insurance in 2007. This corporate giant was actually banned from 15 American states and six countries worldwide until 2008 due to a diabolical reputation and a resistance for paying, to paying out on genuine health insurance claims. Yet they were still appointed as advisors by the John Major UK government. In keeping with the philosophy of the Aylward and Lucasio 1995 paper, there was a strong ideological resistance to the reality of the lives of the disabled community who are unfit to work, described as being economically inactive. This was demonstrated in November 2001 when the Malingering and Illness Deception Conference was held in Oxford. Most of the participants had an association with Union Provident Insurance and the goal of the conference was the transformation of the British welfare state influenced by the health insurance industry. One of the conference members representing a commercial occupational health provider actually compared the disabled community to disabled apes. He claimed that when an ape lost a hand, other apes didn't join forces to provide help or to provide food. The disabled ape was required to fend for himself and the speaker didn't feel there was much justification for the state to support so many disabled people who should be motivated to find work. The adoption of the old work test for incapacity benefit had brought the growth in disability benefit claims to stop to a stop, but failed to reduce the inflow of claimants with a mental health problem. By 2005, 39% of the remaining 2.7 million incapacity benefit claimants had a mental health problem, which was just under 1 million people. Since that time, politicians have regularly referenced the need to reduce incapacity benefit numbers by 1 million people, suggesting that mental health was not considered to be a political priority. Mantle Aylward stood down from the DWP in 2005, having been appointed in 2004 as the first director of the new Union Providence Centre for Psychosocial and Disability Research at Cardiff University. The new centre received £1.6 million of funding from Union Providence Insurance for the first five years. Aylward's first commission at the centre was by the DWP, as Blair's new Labour administration invited evidence to justify reductions in the growing costs of the welfare budget. Ail was, was joined at the centre by Gordon Waddell, a former orthopaedic surgeon turned academic. In order to meet the political requirement to reduce the numbers of disability benefit awards, there was a need to create a much more stringent assessment. The scientific and conceptual basis of incapacity benefits was quickly produced at the centre by Woodell and Aylward in 2005. 
This government commissioned report recommended the adoption of the Waddell Aylward non-medical BPS model of assessment to further restrict access to disability benefits and without any supporting evidence. The report recommended the reduction of incapacity benefit claimants by 1 million, the reduction of the value of incapacity benefit to the same level as unemployment benefit, and the use of sanctions for non-compliance of conditionality by benefit claimants. In 25, Woodell and a the 25 Woodell and Awood report was immediately discredited by Professor Alison Ravatz, who exposed the content as being largely self-referential. It is not research undertaken in the spirit of open inquiry. It is commissioned research and as such predisposed towards ideologically determined outcomes. The methodology, the methodology used by the new more stringent Waddell A would be BPS model of assessment was replicating the BPS model used by Union Provident Insurance, which successfully resists funding insurance claims. All these punitive suggestions would eventually become a part of UK social policy reforms. Union Provident Insurance were identified in 2002 by an American judge as running disability denial factories. At the same time as the company was sponsoring the new centre at Cardiff University, they were identified as being an outlaw company in 2005 by John Garamundi, who was an American insurance commissioner. In 2007, Union were identified by Professor John Langbein of the Yale School of Law as being, quote, engaged in a deliberate programme of bad faith denial of meritorious benefit claims. BBC News identified Unum Insurance as racketeers in a news item in October 2007, where a former Unum staff member confirmed that staff were ordered by supervisors not to fund genuine claimants in order to meet required budget targets. In 2008, Unum were identified by the American Association of Justice as being the second worst insurance company in America. This resistance to funding claims demonstrated by UNAM would be reproduced by the DWP. Follow the, following the Waddell Aylward publication in October 2005, a welfare reform green paper was quickly presented to Parliament in January 2006. Following publication of the green paper, Union Provident Insurance provided a supplementary memorandum for the Work and Pension Select Committee. The memorandum identified the transformation of incapacity benefit to the employment and support allowance. The company recommended the requirement to, quote, disregard diagnosis, reverse the sick note, encourage the government to focus on ability and not disability, change the name of incapacity benefit, and benefits not to be given on the basis of certain disability or illness, but on capacity assessments, which have all come to pass. Incapacity benefit was replaced by the employment and support allowance in October 2008. The unsuspecting, chronically ill and disabled community who were unfit to work would be faced with the fatally flawed work capability assessment which adopted the Bordeaux and Nail with BPS model of assessment to limit successful ESA claims. In adopting this BPS model, the DWP has demonstrated that it didn't follow the ethical duty to adopt a high standard of evidence-based research as expected for interventions in clinical medicine. Despite the fact that DWP documents refer to the work capability assessment as a medical assessment. In reality, the work capability assessment is a non-medical functional assessment as confirmed by submissions to the Work and Pension Select Committee by Union Provident Insurance. What was not reported at the time of the 2006 Green Paper was the essential fact that the work capability assessment had adopted the Waddell Aylward BPS model and disregards all clinical opinion. The assessment has no ethical approval. 
The Waddell Aylward BPS model disregards diagnosis, prognosis, past medical history and prescribed medicines. So does the work capability assessment. With clinical opinion disregarded, many people were always destined to die when quite literally killed by the state. Claimants are invited to provide medical evidence with the disability benefit claims, which are then totally disregarded by the DWP decision makers who admitted to Professor Harrington a decade ago that they don't understand the medical paperwork. So the decision makers support whatever is the reported result as a fatally flawed work capability assessment as conducted by an unaccountable corporate giant. Initially conducted by Atos Healthcare and now the American corporate giant Maximus conduct the work capability assessment. Atos and Capita conduct similar flawed assessments for the personal independence payment which replaced the disability living allowance in another brutal cost limitation exercise negatively impacting on the disability community. A 2016 Public Accounts Committee identified that the three-year contract for these assessments between April 2015 to March 2018 cost the DWP £1.6 billion. In 2007, an investment banker, David Freud, was commissioned by the DWP on behalf of the Blair New Labour Administration to make a series of recommendations to, quote, reduce the number of the most socially disadvantaged people in the country. All these atrocities were introduced by the DWP claiming they wanted to help disabled people. In reality, they have persecuted them. The Freud report took only six weeks to complete. Without any supporting evidence, the report repeated the Waddell and Aylward claim that the number of incapacity benefit claimants should be reduced by one million. The stated political ambition was to get 80% of the population into employment, including the disabled community. Those with the most complex and demanding problems were to be encouraged to find work using the private sector regardless of predictable catastrophic human consequences. Clinical needs were disregarded as all claims were based on a fiscal priority and nothing else. People were always destined to die. Like his political colleagues, Freud included, concluded that many people were unwilling to work and greater conditionality was needed, which was the adoption of neoliberal ideology. Following his 2007 report, Freud was ennobled by the Conservative Party, entered the House of Lords and was appointed as a junior minister in the DWP for the coalition government, despite admitting in an article in the Telegraph in 2008 that he knew nothing about welfare, which he regularly demonstrated. This is the man who in 2014 recommended that disabled people should be required to work for only two pounds per hour, as they are physically incapable of doing the same amount of work as the able-bodied population. There was uproar in the House of Lords. Freud was ordered to apologize by David Cameron for the offense his remarks had caused, but the vilification of the disabled community was destined to continue. Of course, what is never reported is that Professor Danny Dorling demolished Freud's report within weeks of it being published. It seems that Freud had misinterpreted his own references, so there never was going to be the vast numbers of incapacity benefit claimants finding work, regardless of how much the DWP terrified them. However, this critique of Freud's report was written as a guest editorial for the Journal of Public Mental Health and was never reported in the public arena. Similarly, given that it was the Waddell Aylward BPS model that caused so much preventable harm, as the Work Capability Assessment adopted this fatally flawed model. This researcher was relieved when high caliber academics exposed the fact that the Waddell Aylward BPS model demonstrated, quote, no coherent theory or evidence behind this model. 
in a research paper published in 2016 by the Critical Social Policy Journal. Professor Tom Shakespeare and colleagues exposed the Waddell Airwood BPS model as revealing a cavalier approach to scientific evidence and that the evidence does not represent evidence-based policy. Rather, it offers a chilling example of policy-based evidence. Given that the Waddell Airwood BPS model was adopted by the WCA, which is responsible for a catastrophic impact on public health of at least 3 million people, it remains cause for serious concern that the academic publishers fail to alert the public to the significance of this critique of academic, by academic excellence by a national press conference, which should surely be part of their duty of care. And finally, just before the break, considering that a 2016 National Health Service report identified that almost 50% of ESA claimants had attempted suicide at some point. How much longer will this DWP tyranny prevail? Cash not care can easily be translated into greed not need. With DWP reports advising that almost 90 people per month die after being found fit for work following a work capability assessment, and the DWP still resisting claims for a cumulative impact assessment of all the disability benefit cuts, when will someone be actually held to account for what is government enforced death, despair, and preventable harm introduced for political gain? When will the British government stop killing people who are too ill to work? We'll leave it there. Back in 10 minutes. I'll just say in introduction, I mean, I, I suspect from, I know some of the people on the call will not doubt the veracity of any of this, but it just reminded me, Mo, of... Um, in 2010, before the spending review, in a sense, before we really knew the uh, intentions of the coalition government, I went to the cabinet office because I uh, had invented a social policy called personal budgets. I was on a little list at the cabinet office to, and they would, it, they used to ring you up in the summer and you'd head down to London to talk to somebody about ideas for improving things. And I was, so shocked by this experience um i sat with senior civil servants working for the government in the development of its policy whose clearly whose agenda was clearly not informed by any facts they made claims about disability benefits that were totally untrue and based on daily mail headlines not based on any facts at all so everything that you say about the kind of ideological intent um does not surprise me from my personal experience. Um, I, I had a senior member of the cabinet office say to me, all those people with bad backs on disability, disability benefits, that can't be right, can it? That was based on no facts, completely contrary to how DLA was actually given, just based on Daily Mail prejudice, I think, and the intention to find ways as quickly as they could to cut as many disability benefits as they could Shortly afterwards, of course, PIP out of nowhere was rolled out as, a, as you've described as just another way of cutting funding. So I, I, it, entirely plausible, uh, your analysis of what's going on. Um, one of the questions, I, think, I suppose some of the questions seem to be focused on, well, what could we do about this? So I think maybe we should talk a little bit about that. And some of the questions seem to be focused on, um, how would we do something better? So maybe we could spend a little bit of time on that. But let's start with the kind of more critical question. You, you said a number of times, for instance, um, you know, it's, it's a bit disappointing, isn't it? It doesn't really feel like the academic establishment, while the analysis is there, has actually stood up alongside people. Do you think that's fair? What do you think is going on? I think the academic world have their own way of working. And for them to work, they have to have um, grants and to get their grant funding, they're not going to tell any grant funder that they're going to expose the British government for killing people. You know, the academics are limited to what they can do because of the grants they get. There's uh, volumes of academic evidence out there about the dangers of the word capability assessment. None of them lead back to the research which introduced it. None of them. Do you think they all, they all know about my research? 
Do you think there's any hope we might see some new, more courageous action by academics or the academic establishment? No, not, not the way they get their funding. You might get it coming out through books. You know, there's a lot of academics publish books. Um, there's one called The Violins of Austerity by David White and Vicky Cooper. That's worth looking at. Uh, there's a lot of very important information that goes into books that they won't dare put into academic papers because they'll never get published, basically. Um, I have been overwhelmed by the vast numbers of academics who are in touch with me. There's, uh, various academics will print off my papers and distribute them to their own students, which they won't necessarily reference in their own published research. And there's certainly, uh, this is a worldwide problem. Um, all the 38, 37 member countries in the OECD have brought in social policy welfare changes, big changes going on in Australia, uh, Canada, New Zealand, not, none of them as bad as in the UK, but nevertheless big changes and the, the constant message that all these disabled people, all they've got to do is stop being idle and get a job. And um, when, you're, when your introduction, when you mentioned back pain being the problem, that goes back to Gordon Waddell. Gordon Waddell worked with um, Mansell Aylward at the uh, centre provided by Unum Insurance. Gordon Waddell was an orthopaedic surgeon and he was the one who first started mentioning BPS because he didn't, absolutely did not agree that all these people were back pain, that the back pain was as bad as they claimed it to be. And he couldn't fix it through surgery and he didn't accept that all these people had back pain enough to keep them off work. Therefore, there must be a psychological problem. None, yeah. of the, none of it was proven. This was all theory. And you've got social policies brought in that were guaranteed to kill people. And who's been held to account for this? Nobody. It's the same with chronic fatigue syndrome, isn't there? There is a danger sometimes where doctors don't, they can't diagnose why a problem's occurring, so assume that the problem isn't really occurring. <laughs> um, Carl Harris has asked a kind of relevant question here in the chat. So, in a sense, if academics um, are only muted allies at best, Carl is asking who are our allies in highlighting these developments and what opportunities are there for promoting action? Uh, he, he cites psychologists for social change, for instance. Yes, psychologists for social change have been very vocal and very outspoken. Um, and there's a lot of consultant psychologists now speaking out at conferences I don't know that any of them go back to how this was developed. I'm not aware of any others uh, mentioning the influence of Unum Insurance, for example, or the fact that this goes back to Thatcher's idea of getting rid of the welfare state. I'm not aware of that, but certainly psychologists for social change do a lot of great work. John McDonald's just asked if he could make a comment. I think that would be very relevant. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Simon. I, I just wanted to go back to um, Mo's central um, argument about the influence of the insurance company Unum at the very early stage and the strategy it's used by way of um, this funding of supposed academic research, which then sets the sort of um, climate of opinion about the development of policy. Um, and I, Mo is one of the few, um, Francis Ryan and others have taken up some of the ideas too. Mo is one of the few who actually did identify this. Well, in fact, I think she's the only one really in the early stages identifying this. And it, although there's been some coverage of it, it's, it, it, it gets lost in our discussion about what's happened over the last um, 15 years or so. And I think we need to really go back and start looking at how we can republicize this or echo it a bit more in some of the discussions that we're having. It, at the moment, it's almost, if you look at that period, and someone has rightfully pointed out, it happened under Labour and Conservative governments. If you look at that period, it's as big a scandal as Windrush. In fact, it's most probably a much bigger one. I don't want to in any way undermine the, the pain that the Windrush victims had. But if you look at the scale and the point that 
Mo keeps making and, and others have taken up, but I don't think we've really got across more broadly for some reason, is the number of deaths there were during that period. And I, I just think it is as big as a scandal as wind, wind rush. And we, we haven't really broken through in shocking people enough about the scale of it. That's the thing. And partly, I suppose it is, we've still got the, uh, they don't use this language anymore uh, in terms of shirkers and all the rest. They don't use it. But it, it, it has been still sort of almost ingrained in, in some of the uh, reportage that goes on in more subtle forms. And I just wonder now whether or not there is a need for a discussion amongst all of us, um, the disability campaigning groups, Deepak and others, because um, Ellen Clifford has recent book ex explored all this as well, which is really good. I just wonder whether or not now we, we think about another campaign around just the exposure of what went went in, because I do. I think Mo is the one of the few brave enough to say someone needs to be held to account for this. Because it, Windrush was about a hostile environment. Well, this was a not just it was a hostile environment that perpetrated real crimes against disabled people and the chronically sick, and people died. Others suffered incredibly badly. And it wasn't just the individuals, the whole families, it broke people's lives. And I just, I, I'm kicking myself to a certain extent is that maybe we haven't got the message across and more effectively. So I think that discussion needs to happen now. And maybe what can come out of this, Simon and others is, and John Pring is here as well, is maybe convening a number of us all to just talk through how we get that across now. And a lot of it is about hate to say it in terms of campaigning, it is about getting the right language and the slogans and that sort of thing with, with the hard facts that Mo has produced. Uh, it's almost like you want to shake people and think, you know, did you know what was going on in your name? You yeah. know, in, in your name that, that happened. So that's just my point. Just to thank Mo for, for the work that she does is just tremendous. And the, the reason it's tremendous is because it's not just hard hitting, it's based on hard facts, uncontestable facts, that's the whole point. Thank, yeah. thank, you, thank you for that, John. Can I just say that there's all sorts of reasons why this has gone back and nobody's really alert to it, not least the fact that David Cameron put out a national government press ban on any press referencing this. And for those who don't think it happens, yes, it does. And when he did, that was after I had a phone call from the Cabinet Office trying to incentivize me financially to stop the research, which I refused to do. And they tried to blackmail me with the welfare of 80,000 disabled war pensioners, saying that if I stopped the research, they wouldn't have to be uh, reassessed for PIP because they could keep their DLA for life, which they had already been promised by a previous government. They use intimidation nonstop all the time. And when I, re I refused to be silenced, uh, Cameron's cabinet office put out a government imposed national press ban on my research. So the press are not allowed to mention the influence of Unum Insurance with disability assessments in the UK. And if you don't believe it happens, yes, it does, because I had three emails in from three correspondents from two different newspapers warning me that they'd just been told they couldn't mention it. So until you stop this government control of the press, and until we get a free press and not a Tory dominated press, I don't see how that's going to improve because the way most people get their news is through the public agenda and public reality. And the national press are not doing anybody any services here. They're refusing to expose the atrocities that are going on in this country and nobody is held to account. It is it is interesting, the, the press issue, isn't it? Because I used to be published by The Guardian. But as soon as I started to make stronger statements, I can't get an article in The Guardian anymore at all. And um, and there is something, obviously, with the Windrush scandal, it was somewhat the role of journalists in breaking that story, which we've really struggled with. And we're, w w there is a sense in which some of us are speaking to each other about these problems and trying to analyse them and explaining them, but we are not making that breakthrough. So I think it would be a really good idea, though, to explore. I th well, there are some allies in the kind of mainstream media, but certainly we haven't managed to forge a an alliance which has had any kind of traction. 
uh, and we've certainly not framed the issue in a way that's that's made its way through and and it's extraordinary for me now listening to the oh well we might have to return to austerity the measures of austerity are still in place so we, we we've actually allowed austerity to become a kind of an event that happened in the past rather than an ongoing cumulative assault on people's rights so we you know this we will have to kind of really get our act together i think and look at some of these things the work we did during the first five years of austerity on cumulative impact assessment has never really been followed through on. And all of those cumulative impacts have got worse. They didn't stop in 2015. <laughs> it's just, but again, we, we don't have the academic resources, the time, the money, even to do the research necessary. I think now there's such a mass of things that need to be done. So I think that would be a really important opportunity. Certainly the center I would I'd mention also Steph Benston's book, Second Class Citizens, is also a really powerful critique and a really detailed analysis of all the different attacks on disability rights during this period. So I think that needs to be put alongside Mo's work as well as a very important resource for this. Well, um, same, Peter Beresford as well, the work that he did on this. Yeah. yeah, so we've, we've got some great people, we've got some great analysis, but we haven't brought it together in a powerful package. So certainly the center would support anything you wanted to do, John, on this. Um, we'd, we'd be there like a shot. Um, uh, this is maybe more challenging, like especially as I want to finish at three, because I think you know it's, it's, it, people need to, but Jim Elder Woodward, who's been one of the key leaders of independent living movement in Scotland, and he's a friend and a fellow at the center as well, is asking a question in a sense, in one sense, one of the things that's happened is that, um, and you can see this in the new Labour period, the intentions may even have been good at some level about engaging people more in community, about people being more active as citizens. Are there any lessons about how we should be thinking about disability assessments um, from your research, Mo, a better way forward um, if we were thinking afresh? Yes, absolutely, because there is a confusion here. This was the government basically play, playing the disability lobby at their own game because the disabled community did not want to be identified by their medical conditions. This is where the social model came from. And quite rightly, it pointed out all the limitations there are to stop disabled people enjoying a, a, a life that they should have because of all the obstacles out there in society that prevents this. But Waddell and Aylward took that and the government just threw it back in their face because they brought out an assessment for their uh, disability benefits that disregards clinical opinion. You can't do that. And that's what they've done. By being influenced by the second worst insurance company in America, which makes them the second worst insurance company in the world. So you want to get back to what's reality you need diagnosis you need prognosis you need the gp's opinion nobody knows their patients better than the gps it's an atrocity that the gp's opinion is disregarded because through the gps you get the consultant's opinion you need to go back to basics and when it comes to getting benefit then you need medical opinion and you need to get rid of that self care and maximus and any other of these corporate giants who bleed our country dry which the government happily pay them to get rid of the disability problem. Jim also wanted me, I think I've got the right point, Jim, that you wanted to emphasize the last point you put in the chat. And just for me to read it out, he said, I think it's important in any publicity around Mo's work to emphasize that disabled people want to participate in the economic, social, civic life of the community, but the DWP, DWP way isn't helping disabled people to do that. So, and again, that's part of the framing challenge, isn't it here? We need to find something that's powerful, impactful, but doesn't paint disabled people in the light of somehow not having a contribution to make, although that contribution can come in many, many different forms, certainly isn't always being yeah, something called a job. The problem is, though their only concern is for disabled people to be in paid employment whilst disregarding the the volumes of, of, of uh, disabled people in this country who keep this country afloat 
because if the disabled community didn't do voluntary work, this country would be in serious trouble. And they only value work if it's paid employment and disregard the valuable work, such as people like Catherine Hale conduct. And that's where they're going wrong. Disabled people are very valuable. They do very valuable work. We just don't necessarily get paid for doing it. And you're a perfect model of that, Mo. And I, I'm going to make a pitch here for basic income, which is also the means for transforming our understanding of what social value is. I mean, this is the, the confusing social value with being in paid work is the source of so many problems in our society and actually is increasing mental illness uh, for many, many people as well. I mean, we, we've got a mental health crisis in this country and the, the lies we tell about the value of paid work are a big part of that crisis. And we, we need to start recognizing that human beings help each other in multiple different ways and that what is valuable is not being in a job. Um, that isn't the definition of social value by any means. Mo, um, as I've got John here and I've got Mo, John, maybe you'd like to just give us a kind of final thought and commentary um, in a sense, maybe to kind of honor Mo's work, if sorry, if that's a slightly uncomfortable. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. No, fine. No, I just, I, I, I was with Mo when she launched the book. Well, when I can't remember, was that a couple of years ago? I'm losing track of all time now. When we, 2016. Uh, God, was it really that long ago? Anyway, we, we had a good session then in, in the launch of the, the early stage. A lot of that was based upon the early stage of Mo's, um, Mo's research. And to be honest, at that stage, again, um, it was completely new and we knew, I suppose we had a sort of feeling about where are these ideas coming from and what was the agenda here. And Mo sort of put the research together, exposed the link up with them and the private sector in that way, exposed the way it actually had infiltrated into um, the academia and then how it then developed on the policy. And it was almost like a classic corporate lobbying strategy that had been used and it was so effective and it has been so effective Unum. It's good that they've been exposed in terms of, as as uh, Mo said, you know, the quotes of racketeering and stuff like that. So that's been really helpful. But Mo has been chipping away at this, and it takes, you know, should be embarrassed at this. It takes a lot of hard work and determination, but actually it takes quite a lot of courage as well, because you're up against huge institutions, both in terms of the corporate sector, but also governments who actually don't want to have this open debate. And what she's done. She's opened the door to this wider debate, which is terrific. And I'm really, I'm, Mo knows this. I've been extremely grateful for for all the briefings that she's provided us all the way through. The key issue now is how we take it forward. And I, maybe we need to just, uh, um, Mo and uh, Simon and all the others are around the table today. Maybe we just need to think through, we need to get together again and then look at the next stage of this campaign. And the point that you made, Simon, austerity hasn't gone away. And you know as well as I do that, you know, with the it already the spending review this week, um, there were already hints. We know, you know, the pay freeze, cuts in other departments, etc. Particularly local government cuts, social care on its knees, that sort of stuff. You know, austerity is going to be coming back with a vengeance if they're not careful. So we need to mobilise now because always we we've always found this as part of what Mo's work has demonstrated it. We've always found that the the first people who get hit the hardest are those disabled and chronically sick. And that's because, you know, successive governments have thought they're easy to pick off. What we've got to do this time is working on the base of this, is making sure that we, using Mo's work, expose what's happened over the last number of years, a decade and a half at least. And in exposing that, it will help us prevent another onslaught coming on in the future. So. Uh, thanks, Mo, for all you're doing. You know how grateful I've been for the, all the work you've done and the support you've given us. And I just think, uh, Simon, to be honest, it's been invaluable. It really has. Thank and I can't, I can't, you know, I can't pay enough tribute to Mo for what she's done, despite everything thrown at her, including bribes and all the rest. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank you, John. And Mo, do you want to say a last word? Um. <laughs> Thank you very much for attending. Thank you for listening. Thank you to John McDonnell, who out of all of them is the one MP who's always supported my work. 
and he even got it in the hand sort a couple of times from the back benches. We need to bring it back again, John. We need the back benches talking about this. Otherwise, it will never raise its head again, and people will keep on dying as long as we keep on conducting the work capability assessment. It should be abolished. It's time for it to be abolished, and we've got to stop killing people because they're too ill to work. Thank you. Thanks, Mo. Thanks for everything you've done. We really appreciate it. And um, thanks for everybody's attended. I think pretty much everything will go online. Um, the slides, the transcripts eventually when Mo's finished polishing it, the um, and the, the recording of the talk. Um, please stay in touch with the center. You can subscribe to our monthly newsletter. Um, I think I put the link in earlier, or it's available on the site. Um, Again, thanks to John, who, as Mo says, has been one of the few lights in a very dark period um, for disability rights and social justice generally. Uh, so, bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you.